You know what they say, if you make people laugh, they're going to give you their time. You've got about a good two minutes once you make someone laugh that they're going to give you your attention. So I better move fast. Last week, last week, Tamika asked a great question during the Q&A. It was a sharp and honest question. She wanted me to flush out this metaphor I was using. She asked this. She asked, how does one get on the plane? I was using this metaphor about... Christians who are at the airport and Christians who are on the plane. And she wanted to understand the difference between how do you to make that transition? And it's a great question. And it's exactly the thing we're going to be answering today. Now, we found out in the passage that both groups were saved, that this wasn't a salvation question. But we also discovered last week that the difference between them was chalk and cheese. It was the difference between wandering in the desert, knowing God, a faith that's lifeless, without action, without anything really, between that and a life of faith that has rest and peace as we do good works for God. Now, before I answer that question, before I get to that, I want to mention another friend of mine. Another friend of mine, whenever we come up, whenever I come up to him, he says, hello. He always goes to me, oh, he goes, hello, how are you? To which I respond, as the typical Australian does, I'm fine, thanks. And on that particular day, I could be quietly dying inside. Yet I respond, don't I? I'm fine, thanks. Now, he does this really annoying thing. Really annoying. He always just keeps looking. And he goes, okay, now tell me the truth. Oh, I hate it so much. I don't hate it. I dislike it so much. You know why? Because it's really hard to lie twice in a row. That's why it's hard. You know who you are. Hopefully you're watching today. You know, I know you're not here, so that's good. So I'm, I'm only half joking, right? Because it's actually quite a relief. It is actually them, their grace. It is a gift of grace to have someone ask how you are and really want to know the answer, isn't it? It is a beautiful thing. Now, in order to answer them honestly, you've got to be vulnerable. And being vulnerable with someone you can trust is a good thing. In fact, it's life-giving, which is what I'm going to talk about. Why, why else would one of the top 10 TED Talks of all time be titled The Power of Vulnerability? 50 million people have watched that one. Now, we all know that vulnerability has a dark side. We all know that vulnerability has a dark side. Be vulnerable with the wrong person, and you can end up in all kinds of pain. In fact, I think to have our vulnerability met with rejection is probably the worst kind of pain any human can experience. It's far worse than an accident or having something, you know, a hurt or a physical pain. That emotional pain when our vulnerability is met with rejection, I don't think there's anything worse. Now, to bring this back to Tamika's question, I think this is the reason many of us stay at the airport. See, to get on the plane means to give up control of your faith. So many of us, we want to kind of hold on to our faith. We want to be in charge of our faith like everything else in our lives. We want to be the author of our faith, don't we? We don't want to, we don't want to let it permeate into too much of our lives because then too much stuff will change. And, and C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity wrote this section that always stuck with me, and he's talking about being chased, if you don't know, I mean, avoiding moving into you know, sexual immorality of some sort. He doesn't flush out what being chased is exactly in his context, but he talks about it. And he says, I often pray, God, you know, make me chaste, to which, to which a little voice in the back of his head would say, not just yet. Not just yet. But this is not what we're about. We're to hand ourselves over to Christ. We're to allow ourselves, we're to allow Christ to be the pilot of our lives, Christ in charge of our faith. We had to trust Jesus, aren't we? This is what four chapters of Hebrews has been telling us. We can trust Christ. We can be vulnerable with Christ, for he will never let us down. Our vulnerability will always be met with grace, and not just any grace, not just any undeserved gift, but perfect grace. For God's throne is a throne of grace. Well, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to unpack the passage. Now, there's some sharp words here. They're not to hurt us. They're to encourage us. And then I'm going to share two stories. 
One of these short stories is a little bit personal and I've never shared it with anyone, not even my wife. And the second, if you're at home, there's a lot of, oh dear, he's in trouble because they know what I'm like. So I'm getting nervous now. And the second thing is a story that, that I heard this past week that literally brought me to tears. And I really want to share that with you this morning. So two stories coming up. But first, let me pray. Lord God, thanks for your grace, your love, and your mercy. Please open our hearts, open our minds to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1 says this, Therefore, Since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you have been found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. The author's wrapping up all the stuff we talked about last week, how the Hebrews, along with Moses, wandered the desert. They knew there was a God. They believed in God, but they failed to trust. They failed to give honor to God, even though God was providing for all their physical needs and their spiritual needs. And because of this, they never entered his rest. They never entered the promised land. Let me put it this way. The Hebrews in the desert, they believed in God. They believed in God. I mean, you've only got to look out the window to believe there is a God. I mean, with every respect to any atheists who might watch this later or who may be part of us, you've really just got to look around you for this is not an accident. You can't look out there and tell me that beauty of creation and the stars and all of it is an accident. The combination of our selfish genes over time somehow bursting into life and reason and art and all the things we enjoy and love, it's not. In fact, science has moved on from atheism for the most part. Intelligent creation, intelligent design is the way of today. But a belief in a God or a creator God is not enough. It's not enough to receive that promise of rest. And the difference, in fact, may indeed be a question of vulnerability. Vulnerability. When we choose to be vulnerable, When we get down on one knee and ask that person to marry us, to give of ourselves, to receive of them, to share our whole lives with a person, that's vulnerability. When it comes to letting our teenagers leave home or push them out or young adults or whatever they may be and and trusting that they're going to be okay, that requires vulnerability. Same thing when you go to a job interview, giving of yourself, You're putting yourself on the line to be evaluated by other people. That's vulnerability. And when I'm vulnerable, my hands and my underarms, I sweat. Just so you know, just thought I'd share that with you. Um, I've got two more minutes now because people laughed. All right. The difference may in fact, it was a question of vulnerability. Here we go. So there's generally two responses to a show of vulnerability. You're all looking at my underarms, aren't you? (laughs) there's generally two responses to a show of vulnerability the first one is rejection and we know how much that hurts I don't think there's any pain more pain we can suffer we can go through than be faced with rejection at a show of vulnerability the second one of course is grace it's that undeserved gift of a yes I will marry you It's an undeserved gift of children who actually make their own way in the world and they're okay. I mean, that's a beautiful thing. Or getting that new job. Sadly, many experience the rejection, not because they choose to be vulnerable, but because they fail to trust. They fail to take the risk. And this kind of rejection, the one that never took the risk of being vulnerable, it is is worst kind of pain it's slow it's long lasting often this kind of pain can carry on until the end of our lives we take it to the grave and if you need any proof just google up a list of people's regrets in their final years of life and you look up that list and you will find almost all the things they regret is as a result of their failure to be vulnerable at the right times that and of course a desire to be more selfish but You know, you can't have it both ways, can you? My point still stands. Now, I think that what is 
Now, I think that, what, that this is what is going on for the Hebrews in the desert. But for those of us who have chosen to be vulnerable with Jesus, there's no such worry of entering God's rest. For we enter God's rest through faith. It's in the next verse, verse 3. Now, we who have believed enter that rest just as God has said. I'm going to skip a few verses because it's really just repeating what we've said already and what we went through last week. And I'll bring us to verse six. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So, of course, the author's talking to their Hebrew audience primarily. In fact, they're begging them not to do what many have done before, and that's to harden their hearts. For a hardened heart cannot be vulnerable. A hardened heart cannot receive by faith. A hardened heart, it can only and ultimately experience that rejection and the pain that it's so desperately trying to avoid. This is the reason for so many regrets in our old age. But the author's not done. Verse 8, for if Joshua, another great leader, one who actually led them out of the desert, for Joshua had given them, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for anyone who enters God's rest, also rest from their works, just as God from his what it means to enter God's rest, what it means to get on the plane is becoming clear. To enter God's rest is to rest from our works. The works of trying to save ourselves. The works of constantly trying to be good enough. The works of trying to hide our sin and our shame. The works of trying to go our own way. The works of always putting ourselves before God and not letting him into every sphere of our lives. It's a double-edged sword, this thing. On one hand, this is a fallen world. And we've got to work. We've got to work hard to put sin behind us. We've got to work hard to avoid temptation. God helps us in these things. But we've still got to work at it. To resist. To be God's house this is the message from last week we've got to work hard to be this great witness to the world but on the other hand the vulnerable christian in the face of god's grace mercy receives that rest now now and here's the point it is in the receiving of this rest that we become the witnesses we are supposed to be it's the receiving of this rest that we are no longer burdened with doing things in our own strength, going our own way. And most of all, we're no longer burdened with the shame and the regret that comes with all of that other stuff. But again, not just this. I said it last week. What's at stake is not our salvation. I know that Hebrews can sound a bit like this at times. Often you've got to take a double take and go, wait a minute, is he saying I've got to work for my faith? That's not what's going on. It's not the case. What's at stake here is the salvation of those around us. It's in verse 11. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, that's to be obedient, so that no one will perish by following their or our example of disobedience. If we who are saved, continue to be disobedient, continue to live contrary to God's word, then who's going to give a rat's what we believe? They're not going to see Christ in us. They're just going to see the world in us. And they see that everywhere. So we will not change anything. All right, I've covered a heap of stuff. I've been speaking to our heads now, hopefully. Not the tops of your heads as people have gone to sleep. No. Hopefully, I'm speak, I've been speaking to heads now for, what, 10 minutes. We're going to change gears because I want to speak to our hearts now. Let me ask a question. Who's ready to be vulnerable? Oh, I'm glad nobody put their hand up because then the next bit wouldn't have worked. I just knew that no one would put their hand up. So I decided when writing this that I would be forced to go first. So good thing I've got something prepared. 
All right, let me go first. I'm going to share the story that I've never shared with anyone. Did you know that it took me four years to propose to Alison? Four years. Why? Because I was gutless. I was really insecure and I just didn't know. <laughs> Why did it take me four years? Because I was afraid of being vulnerable. That's the reason. I started a technology business when I was 19 years old during a boom. I had everything I could need. I could buy all the toys I wanted. I mean, I couldn't afford a cruise ship that had a submarine in it. But, you know, what I mean, I could buy whatever I liked. I had all the things. I had plenty of friends, loads of people around us. I had employees. I had a business. I had money, as I've said. People looked up to me. They respected me. I was in control. I was in charge of my life. I often joke that to get married would make me half as rich. That's not funny. Why would people look up to me? I have no idea. Thank God I popped the question. Thank God I stood in that place of vulnerability and asked her to marry me. And I didn't end up half as rich. I gained way more than I gave. And it continues to this day. And this is how vulnerability works. Be vulnerable with the right person. And you will not lose. It is always gain. The amount of gain depends on how trustworthy, how honorable, how wonderful that person is. Can you see where I'm going with this? Who is the most worthy, the most honorable, the most loving, the most full of grace? Jesus. Jesus is. Now, it's your turn. Let me read verse 12 first. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Firstly, for the Christians in the room and those who have joined us from home, those who may watch this later, firstly for you, if we want to grow, if we want less sin in our lives, if we want to get rid of that voice from C.S. Lewis that says, not just yet, then we're going to have to be vulnerable to Christ, to his word. We're going to have to let it change us, grow us. We're going to have to let it be his way, not our way. Secondly, if you're not a Christian, then I, I'm just going to pray for you. Let me pray. Please, God, cut through the barriers, soften hearts, allow a moment of vulnerability so they can receive your word and your life-giving spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. The word of God is not a fantasy. It's not a fluffy bunny story that gives us a temporary feeling of warmth and security. It's not a crutch for the weak. It is alive. It's active. It's powerful. It is a powerful weapon. And when we receive it with vulnerability, it breaks us and makes us new. Penetrates every part of our soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Why? So we can get to the heart of the matter and purify our thoughts and attitudes that separate us from God. We call this sanctification. For verse 13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Hebrews is getting serious. The author is making it clear why we should take that step and trust and be vulnerable with Christ. For verse 14, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess for we do have a high priest. What went too far? We'd have a high priest. We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. The reason my friend is able to get past the I'm okay barrier it's because his body language, his face, all of it speaks empathy. 
Jesus does this and much, much more. Jesus suffers with us for what did he do when he was faced with Lazarus' death? He wept with them. Jesus has compassion for us. For what did he do when the blind were shouting out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. He healed them. And lastly, what did Jesus do? Knowing that we, as this verse just said, would have to make an account before God. He knew that we would be the recipients of God's wrath for a lifetime of sin and hurt. I mean, who's more offended when you hurt someone, the person or their parent? You hurt, my kids hurt someone else's kids. I can tell you it's the parent who seems more offended than the kid. Who do you think is the most offended when you hurt another person? God, the one who created them. And we are recipients of that anger, of that wrath. And Jesus knows this. So Jesus steps into the gap, takes God's wrath upon himself. He chooses to die for us so we may enter his rest with him. And because of this, in our final verse for today, verse 16, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I said I'd close with the story that brought me to tears this past week. I heard this story listening to John Dixon's podcast. It's called Undeceptions. It's a great show if you're ever, if you're ever in the car and you listen to something. It's called Undeceptions. I'm trying to undeceive ourselves is his motto. And he says this. It's about a, an Australian convict named Samuel Python. He says this. John Dixon, he tells the story of how Samuel stole a piece, a piece of cloth at 19 and served two years in jail. He talks about how a couple of years later that he was caught with a stolen watch and charged with transportation and sent to Australia as a convict. Just five months later in Australia, he was again in trouble. He was found in an officer's quarters trying to steal a shirt, a stocking, and a comb. John Dixon quips that he sounds more foolhardy than evil. And following this, Samuel was tried and sentenced on May, June 23rd, 1788, and promptly hung on Sydney's public gallows, where the exclusive Four Seasons Hotel now stands. He was just 21 years old. As sad as that is, as difficult as that is to take on board, it didn't bring me to tears. What brought me to tears is next. The night before being hung, He wrote a letter of pure vulnerability to his mum. He wrote this. My dear mother, with what agony of soul do I dedicate the few last moments of my life to bid you an eternally do. Ere this hour tomorrow, I shall have entered into an unknown and endless eternity. Too late, I regret my inattention to your admonitions and feel myself sensibly affected by the remembrance of the many anxious moments you have passed on my account. For these and all my other transgressions, however great, I supplicant to the divine forgiveness, and encouraged by the promises of that Saviour who died for us all, I trust to receive that mercy in the world to come, which my offences have deprived me of in this. Commend my soul to divine mercy. I bid you an eternal farewell. Your unhappy dying son, Samuel Python, Sydney Cove, 24th of June, 1788. Why is Sam so unhappy? Having received that faith and forgiveness of Christ. It's because it was too late. It was too late to live out to live out that hope on this earth. Well, my friend, while it's still today, it's not too late. Would you let yourself be vulnerable? You won't regret it. You will not find regret. You will not find rejection. You will find rest and peace 
rest for your soul and peace for your heart.